welcome to Live Your Own Way with me, Lucy Gleason Interiors, chatting homes, life and inspiration with my very special guests. Hello, great to have you here this week with me for this podcast chat with Royal Television Society nominated TV production designer and extremely lovely person Richard Drew. With a diverse and huge career starting in the late 1980s, with more recent credits including Ricky Gervais' Afterlife on Netflix, This Time with Alan Partridge on BBC One, Stathlet's Flats on Channel 4, Sky One's Intelligence and also Billionaire Boy for Sky. If we roll back to the very start of Richard's career, then there's Bergerac, One Foot in the Grave, Top of the Pops, Crystal Maze, Game On, Smell of Reeves and Mortimer, Smith and Jones, Big Train, EastEnders... I really could just go on and on, but I'm sure you'd like me to start the podcast chat. So let's find out how Richard creates the visual concepts on these shows, what the design process is, and how important colour is to him for setting the scenes and help tell the story to the audience. Richard, hello, and thank you for joining me. It's so nice to have you here, and I especially appreciate you taking some time out of the day off. (laughs) Yeah, a rare day off, a rare day off. I'm in Nottingham at the moment, so. I'm doing a little thing for uh, UK Gold called Newark, Newark, sort of three weeks filming in um, in Newark, funnily enough. And um, yeah, so this is uh, into our last week tomorrow and then finally off for Christmas uh, on, the, on the Friday. I thought I'd start with how you started it in your career, because it's so clear to me that you still really love your job. When you were deciding what to do for a career, were you set on a life in TV and design? Yes, in, in a roundabout way. Yes, because I, um, well, I had sort of vague aspirations to act. I guess all, a lot of us maybe growing up have that. And also I was fascinated by telly from a very, very early age, particularly. And um, my parents, as a me- because I'm old enough to remember when we used to rent TVs from Radio Rentals and all the rest of it. My parents, when... Um, I was really naughty as a kid, used to send the telly back to the renter um, for a week as punishment. And it it was like the worst thing they could do, you know. So I've always been fascinated by TV. But I guess when you're watching something, you're not necessarily thinking about anything else. You're just looking at the performers. And so I had a vague idea that I actually wanted to possibly do acting. And I ended up, you know, joining youth theatres and doing school plays like, you know, loads of us have done. But, you know, very quickly realised I quite enjoyed, you know, the behind the scenes and the kind of process. And I did a, I was lucky enough to be involved with um, my local theatre in uh, where I grew up at the Queen's Theatre in Hornchurch. Used to do the annual pantomime, they still do. And um, they used to engage you know, 20 local kids to be supporting artists. And um, I was lucky enough to audition for Cinderella and uh, ended up in the chorus um, sometime around November 1979. I stood on a stage, professional stage, for the first time. Our last rehearsals before the show started at the beginning of December. And I can remember, to, so I'm I'm actually age 12. So yeah, I'm age 12 and I'm walking onto that stage and I just remember standing on a stage and, and kind of being completely captivated by not only 504 seats in front of me, but, you know, seeing the wings and the back of scenery and and the kind of mechanics of, of, of how something is made. And, and, it was an absolute light bulb moment for it. And I can even remember what side of the stage I walked on from. It's so clear in my head. Um, and so that was it. That was that was the moment where I my head was sort of slightly turned. And then <clears throat> I've said to a few people before, I kind of had an idea at 13 and definitely knew by the time I was 16 that this is what I wanted to do in my life. I, I, by, by 16, my mind was made up. And did you go on to study at college then? You studied art and design? Yeah, so I did a um, did a lower six school and drama and all the rest of it. And then I did a sixth form college course at 
Barking College of Technology, which has probably got some far more grandiose name now, but um, in in Romford, and I studied. I did a performing arts, so I studied more theatre. I did theatre. I did O levels in theatre design, film, and TV. Which, given where I grew up, and you know, given it's the mid eighties, was sort of really unusual O level courses. But they ran these courses, and it was just you know the most amazing years education I think I ever had and then I went to West Sussex College then I went to West Sussex College Design in Worthing which is where ironically now where I live and um, I did um, a BTEC diploma in theatre design and they jumped me straight on the second year because my performing arts course sort of counted as a foundation year. Um, it was a very you know practical course um, that theatre design course, we did a bit of everything and I just loved it. And then I went to film school for two years in South Wales. So kind of I don't know whether I I had quite made my mind I don't know why I sort of slightly sideways stepped with film school, but as it turned out, it was the best thing I could have done because again it was a very uh, practical course. Um I think we only had to attend two lectures in two years and that was a, a HND. Um, we were just handed projects to do and off we went. You know, you were given given a camera, given some 16 mil film or 8 mil film or, you know, um, low band pneumatic videotape or VHS tape cameras. And we're just told, told to go and make stuff. Um, so I ended up at film school kind of becoming the guy who got the props sort of in, you know, a kind of, if any project was being done and somebody needed something, they ended up coming to me. So I sort of made a little kind of, you know, a little niche for myself. Um, and we ended up doing, you know, Victorian kind of melodrama things. And we did a World War II film, which, you know, for students was quite ambitious. And we kind of pulled it off, you know, in our own way. We ended up shooting on a... Um, period railway station in the seven valley railway and we you know we took over some of the college which was a turn of the set of sort of edwardian building so it worked perfectly so we turned you know a couple of staircases in the corridor into sort of war offices and and hospitals and and you know by that point i was sort of making a nuisance of myself with um bbc wales and htv wales i got adopted as a student, they used to HTV used to run an adopt a student scheme where they took some students and kind of gave them a kind of in into the sort of workings of, you know, of uh, of the industry. A friend of mine got um, in with a producer and ended up working on a series of Boon, and I got adopted by HTV and I ended up with their design department. So and then got access to their prop store and you know and so on and so forth. So was really lucky in hindsight that 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 kind of happened because our little world war ii film was kind of pretty much dressed with a combination of a few charity shop finds and and, and dressing from um from the htv prop store um but while i was while i was looking for stuff i hope this is all right as an answer this is a very long-winded answer no I'm, I'm i'm listening it's great i kind of got involved in doing a bit of costume as well you know as you do as you, you know you kind of muck in and we needed some um boots for our we had the we had the uniforms um but we didn't have any boots and i contacted the bbc wales um costume store and they ended up lending me some boots went in and got them got chatting to a costume assistant you know in the costume store and you know i was coming to the end that, that was my second year so this is kind of around april may 88 and i was due, due to leave in july june july and um we were chatting about me and what I was up to and I said oh I really want to get you know into the design department and I think she thought I made costumes so then I get asked to go and see the senior costume designer as sort of an interview so I went up for this interview and you know within minutes you know this this um she re she said well you want to see the design uh, production design department you don't see me so she picked up the phone and I and you know I literally went out of office I went went across to the other side of the building, went and saw the senior set designer, uh, production designer. Um, and then, what was that? June, July, and then August the 8th. 8th of the 8th, 88, Lucy, all the 8th. Um, <laughs> I started work um, in BBC Wales. And it was just a, you know, a sequence of 
kind of events that kind of got my foot in the door. I mean, I was sort of phoning around and I was taking my portfolio up to, you know, various regional TV, you know, studios as you did. I mean, obviously this is pre-internet day. So, you know, you literally used to sit waiting by a phone to ring and sorting out interviews and jumping on trains with portfolios and all the rest of it. Um, but that's kind of how it started. I've I've sort of still keep in contact with a couple of my old kind of film school students and one of them paul was is is well he's a he's a director now of, of, of some note and he was telling me that he used to go and see the guys that used to run the course for years afterwards and the thing that they because i was always very puzzled why they chose me to go on the course it was only 14 places and i think it was 40 i think something like 1400 applicants it was you know a lot of people for very few places but apparently the only criteria they ever had was you know obviously besides being you know vaguely passionate about the, the, you know film and was that they just wanted to find people that were employable that they thought were were worthy of their time because they thought they would you know get jobs and you know never a true word is spoken because that's what happened you know just being single you know bloody minded for me and just sort of badgering the right people at the right time and you know not taking no for an answer which is something that I continue to this day um yeah there I was so you know I'd sort of within six weeks eight weeks of finishing film school I was um I was a design a design assistant in BBC Wales in Cardiff how's that (laughs) yeah it's it's amazing how it can happen did you find the BBC a very good place to uh, continue learning was it a good basis for the rest of your career definitely without a shadow of a doubt um I because when I, I mean, let's be honest, I'm starting a job and I don't really know what the job is. You know, I've got a vague idea of what, you know, a designer does and assistant does. So I was very fortunate in BBC Wales because they can't, it was essentially a five month apprenticeship. I mean, it was sort of, you know, they, I was getting paid, which is amazing, but I was just learning and I was sent, sent out with all kinds of designers, period things, studio things, news bit of sport. I think the first job I ever did on my own was um, go to Swansea's uh, football ground and literally staple a black felt piece of cloth onto a wall so somebody could do an interview against it. And that was the sum total, you know. And this was it. This was the first time I'd been out on my own, you know. Turned up very early just to basically hang this black drape. It was really... And thinking about it now, it's really funny. Um, But... I kind of, yeah, it was just brilliant. And then I got a job in, so I'd done five months in BBC Wales. So now I'm sort of on a radar uh, down down in that there, London. And um, I ended up going to the BBC in London and did a kids TV series called Tricky Business, which, which was really good. Then I went back to Wales and did another six months. And then I went back to London. Um, so that's the beginning of 1990. Is that 80, yeah, 89 or 90? 89. And I um I think I did then the Les Dennis Laughter Show. I think that was what I did. Um then I did some going live, uh, kids Saturday morning TV, which is a steep learning curve. And then I ended up one of the big things I ended up fairly early doors, I ended up um assisting on Bergerac. Uh, which it was was yeah so that was ba- that was kind of April 1990 through to November so there is a massive learning curve there because that's my first bit of location filming proper and foreign filming essentially um, filming in Jersey as well as um, we filmed in in, in Brittany and in, in Saint Malo in in France and I you know I find that quite incredible that you know. That's 1990, and only 18 months previous, I was still a student. And, you know, there I am actually living the life of Riley, you know, and thinking this is what it's all about because I got given a hire car. I was getting, you know, I was getting, and I got given a soft top hire car, would you believe? Um, an XR3i, which for an Essex boy was like a dream car back in the day. Um, and, you know, you're getting money for, because the BBC used to give you money for clothing filming clothing you got per diems and I thought blimey this is it I'm absolutely absolutely made and I did a year on that um and then I uh I think the next big job I did was Grain Chill so that was a sort of a little bit of a come down um 
but very enjoyable. Um, but yeah, it was, it was. And the BBC had a particular way of um, drawing. I mean, I learned, I mean, I could technic do technical drawing, but um, I definitely learned on the job at the BBC. And the BBC had a particular way of how you laid a, uh, lay a drawing out and how you, even how you wrote your handwriting, you know. Um, they used to have a guy who used to essentially sign off your drawings, it was like a teacher he used to red circle um, in pencil where you'd made mistakes and you'd have to go back and correct them before you could issue them. I mean, you couldn't imagine that happening now, given that a lot of what I do seems to be on A4 bits of paper and um, whatever the uh, non-smoking equivalent is of a fag packet. That seems to be how I operate now. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was very, very routine. And the BBC had an in-house um, uh, prop buyers and construction managers and transport. And then there was a big prop store and then you could get um, stock scenery. So if you were working on a, like a Les Dennis show, for example, which was turning around, you know, a dozen sets a week for sketches, you had this sort of um, essentially library of scenery that you could pull together because, you know, you couldn't, build that amount of stuff in a week so you'd use stock scenery and stock rostra so what that was very good for me because i've done sketch shows since is you know the speed your speed of thinking and how can you solve a problem very quickly because the design was slightly going off the beaten track i feel tv design is and film design is is as much about problem solving as the creative it's how can i come up with a solution you know to to do x um the kind of idea that you're sat you know in your studio surrounded by samples books and you know and research you know as much of that is lovely but the, but that's only one percentage of what you actually do a lot of it is just problem solving um so the bbc kind of you know taught me that to you know and i the bbc even taught you how to fold a a plan correctly you know, there's a there there was a BBC way to, how to fold a piece of paper. There was a BBC um, scale ruler which is unique to the BBC. It's called the rationalised foot, and it was I've still got my ruler. And what the BBC decided was that um, one foot it was equivalent to three hundred mil, which when in fact it's three hundred and thirty point three mil to be precise. Um, but the BBC thought, no, I wouldn't have any none of that. So we they kind of rounded it down. So all those BBC studio plans and the way that you hired scenery and the way you drew everything up, you just said, right, one foot is equivalent to 300 mil. And that's that's that was the BBC way. So their own unique uh, measuring system. But you never forget these things, do you? No. And I'm always, and I'm, you know, and I still walk into, I, I'm really funny because I'm kind of very dual with the way I measure things up. I think in feet, but I tend to draw in metric. So I think in imperial and draw in metric, but, and I'm also very handy as a designer. I am bang on six foot tall. I'm right on the money. And that is such a useful height to be as a production designer. Cause you can walk into any room and just say, right, well, I'm six foot. Bosh, what's that? And you know that there's that thing where you put stretch your arms out, and in theory, you're the same height as you are width if you stretch your arms out. So I can, you know, walk in and get an idea of a room, and I'm fortunate enough to be right on six foot. So it's, um, yeah, it's well handy. But your CV is is really diverse with lots of different genres. So um, is there a very different design process each time? Because obviously, you'll have different visions every for every different show. Yeah, I think it's actually a little bit of a bugbear of mine. And I think a lot of designers feel like this, that you kind of get, I mean, I'm doing a lot of comedy, for example, at the moment, and I've kind of back-to-back -back kind of comedy shows. And I'm very happy doing that. Um, I would like to do a drama. I have to kind of, you know, I suppose the Afterlife series is as near to straight drama. And I, in fact, I've got something coming up next year, which is, you know, pretty much a drama. But I think there is this kind of, snobbery i don't know if that's the right word because that sounds slightly pointed but yeah snobbery where oh you can't possibly do a drama because you do comedy but my argument always is well you know i don't choose props with red noses on them i choose the same props my process is the same it's just the script is funny as opposed to a straight drama where it not isn't necessarily funny so i don't know that there is 
a different process. Obviously, when you're doing um, sketch, something like a sketch show, I kind of tend to view those more. They're kind. You've got to make a big bold statement very, very quickly. So, with a sketch show, I think you're you tend to be a bit more cliche driven, I suppose, in terms of your the way you set out to dress something. Um, and obviously, light entertainment, shiny floor shows, and all the rest of it have got their own briefs. And you know, it's all about um, with those sorts of shows. It's all about areas for things, whether it's a chat area or performance area or the screen area or the bit where they go into the audience. It's all about um, breaking breaking a studio space down into pieces that flow from one to the other. I mean, I think that, and that's very unique to sort of light entertainment, I think, particularly. Um, but no, I still go, I still tend to do mood boards and mood boards I'm a big fan of and um sketch I, I still draw you know freehand um so for me that's a kind of process and then I I always joke and say I have young people to do this but I do there's there's people who I use who can do convert my hand-drawn plans into you know sketch up plans and all the rest of it and sort of computer drawings as I like to call them and equally with visuals you know making 3d visuals and and, and kind of walkthroughs so i tend to work i'm I'm a little bit old-fashioned let's be honest you know um i kind of make a 3d model by card if i want to i draw it all up by hand i know it'll fit together i suppose there's an element of um of control about that um because we all like to be in control us designers and um and then i kind of hand it over to somebody to say right turn that into a you know computer visual for me um because people on you know the, the way the world is now people tend to understand that more i still think direct is quite like a um uh cardboard model um something that you can actually pick up and touch and put to your eye and you know and have in your hand i think there's something rather lovely about a 3d tactile thing that you can hold um and i quite like sending out you know and, and eventually effectively you know, mood boards done on a computer are no different from mood boards I used to do with cutting out bits from magazines and, you know, colour photocopying from library books. You know, it's just another way of doing it. Um, yes. So apart from light entertainment, I would say the processes are pretty much the same. It's breaking scripts down and and, and budgets, I guess. You know, but that's, the, you know, that's a massive factor in, you know, all of what we do is it, it, a lot of the ideas are kind of driven in part by by how much you can afford to spend as well. Yeah, and co colour is obviously a really massive thing for you to consider for each project. Yeah, huge. How much time do you spend on that and the psychology behind it? Well, interestingly, I think where this, I think the colour thing for me, come, well, per, partly personal because I, I, um, I like, I like colour, um, and I, that's a really odd thing to say, but um, you go into countless homes that are just you know series of shades of gray or beige or gray what do they call it grayish yeah that's it grayish um <laughs> so i i you know I, I i personally like strong bold colors and i think a lot of light entertainment back in the day and actually to a degree now if you break down i mean if you watched you know strictly without the lights on it's a very gray set and you know it's all down to um I mean, the Strictly set, by the way, is brilliant, but it's it's all down to lighting and reflective surfaces that can be lit. Um, there's pops of red, obviously, but I I think that's where my desire to... Because I think the thing about putting colour onto set, you have to commit to it. And I think people are basically afraid of committing. And, and, and if you're prepared to be, you know, to have the courage of your convictions and commit... To throwing a color onto something i think you should just go for it and i think color so says a lot i mean i i I've, I've mentioned this before a couple of people have asked me about the afterlife set in particular is that um that's actually quite a colorful set tony's house is 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 colorful and the general feeling it's actually quite colorful and that all came about in particular because we 
I was chatting to Ricky and one of his reference points was uh, It's a Wonderful Life. And we, um, and I, I ended up going around his house and he was telling me about the floor and not breaking up the floor space with different carpets or wooden floor or whatever. He wanted the same color throwing through. So, and if you look at It's a Wonderful Life, that's what goes on in the downstairs part of the house. But, and I kind of went away and thought about it and I found some color renders of the wonderful life uh, of, of stills from It's a Wonderful Life. And I, and I just went, God, it sort of just popped in my head and I thought, well, that's it. So all of the colors on that afterlife are based on the colors of It's a Wonderful Life. So it's not a reference into when Ricky's saying about the, program, the film, he's, I've not referenced it in terms of the look, apart from maybe the wooden floor, you know, passing nod to the wooden floor. But I've referenced it on the color. Um, and all those colors seem to work for Tony. They're kind of blues and mustards and, and dirty greens and, you know, dirty browns and stuff. And I really like that kind of color palette. And also the way it's graded, the blues in particular really, really pop out. And the, ter and the teals. I mean, they're kind of quite contemporary colors to this day. And that just goes to show how brilliant the design on It's a Wonderful Life was. But I, I like, you know, I like using color. I use color a lot on the um, on the Alan Partridge set. That's quite, you know, there's quite a lot of strong colors, which are kind of all lifted from various BBC shows where they use bits and bobs, and they're very BBC colors. I like to think purples and reds and oranges. So I kind of use a lot of that. When you're on location with the with the rooms, do you ever? Or are you allowed to paint them or do you just find places that are suitable? You, you, you absolutely can do it. And I've, I've done it on occasion. It's a, I personally, I quite like finding the right house because if you find, if you've gone and found the right, right house, you know, because it's almost, you walk in, you get a feeling from it. And that's like real life, isn't it? If you, if you're moving home, you walk into places, you get kind of a feeling for it. Um, but yeah, you can do it. You, there, there's this, um, there's this thing called mask it, which is essentially giant masking tape. It's like a wallpaper wide rolls of masking tape. And you push that on a wall, paint it, and then peel it off. I mean, that's kind of how you can do it. Where what you what that does end up costing is money, you know, because you need to get into a location then two or three days before you would normally need to if you were just dressing it. And it requires, you know, painters to take take it on and take it down. So um if you've got the budget, yeah, absolutely do it because it, you know it's lovely. But I, but I, I personally quite like trying to find the right house to start with, um, and we certainly did that on Afterlife. We, all those homes we go into for the the little kind of news items that um, Ricky does, Tony's character does, where they go and see the people who've got the local news. All those houses are kind of. I like to call it embellished. They're just embellished with a few props or a different sofa. And the big thing for art department in particular is swapping art over because a lot of art is copyright. So if somebody's house is full of art, we'll go in with some cleared art just to swap over. Um, but yeah, all that, all those places on Afterlife are, are, are for real, with a bar a few tweaks from art department. The care home in Afterlife was all very, all very warm colours, wasn't it? Was that intentional? Well, yes, because we found that we found that how we we actually no, we didn't. Oh, we did. Oh, God, yes, I did paint that. We found the um. So the what happened with the care home was we we went to series two. I think the care home comes in. I think one two one series one. And um, we found this location at a place called Bullstrode House, which is near Gerrard's Cross. And in fact, that's where we also shot the um, psychiatrist. Now, the psychiatrist is interesting because that's got a very strong color palette in that. That's like a bold teal and a gray. Well, we walked in and found that room like that, and it was just like a gift for us. And um, we then shot the care home in the same building, but up a flight of stairs. And I and I and I just chose peach because I quite liked it. It felt like slightly an older color, but oddly, as it's turned out, it's one of those colors that works really well in the gray as well um and then we so we repaint we did we were able to repaper that room because it was an empty abandoned kind of house so we didn't have to reinstate because on top of everything else reinstating always you know costs money um so we 
went and did all, we repapered it, painted it, um, and then left the corridor as it was. I think we put a new carpet in. We put a teal, car, a blue carpet in that. So it is quite strong. And then all the accents coming from the furniture and the that kind of ash furniture that was everywhere about 20 years ago and and all the sort of bedding and all the peach bedding. Series two, we weren't able to go back. The house had, Bullstrode House had been vandalized and I mean quite significantly vandalized. So um, if you watch series one and series two, hopefully you won't notice the difference because it's seamless, uh, Lucy. But um, they're actually set. The series two, it's a it's a set, it's a copy. So we carbon copied the uh psychiatrist and we carbon copied the um the, the, the care home. And then there was all the where where the people sit, the sort of the lounge area, and I that was all then created. So I kind of created the corridor and then the lounge area off of dad's room. In the real location, we wouldn't have been able to do that. So it actually ended up becoming quite a happy accident. So yeah, it kind of ended up becoming very fortuitous that. I suppose I was thinking it was a slightly older colour, that peach. And I was thinking maybe the last time it had been decorated was the early 90s when all that peach and kind of rag rolling and all that, when people used to put those printed borders around their walls. And we found some. In fact, what we did, I think we found one roll of some really naff printed border uh, in a DIY clearance place. And we actually got it reprinted. So... Um, we we kind of scanned it and then got it reprinted in sections to go around the room. So, yeah, I think I was sort of channeling sort of early 90s, really, thinking that that was when maybe the last time that care home had been sort of decorated. Well, I was going to ask you, actually, it's a good that you mentioned about the border because it must be hard to find some props sometimes, especially if you're working on a, a period drama. Well, it is. I mean, you've got um, obviously hire companies and certain hire companies will do certain things but the, the, it's actually those decorative touches and of course everybody we all do it we all think oh yeah I remember those used to be above and then you forget oh god 20 years has gone 30 years has gone since you've last seen things like that um I mean it you know whether it's just do you remember again in the early 90s suddenly glass everything was frosted glass there was frosted glass everywhere and now you can obviously find stuff in charity shops but it's that sort of stuff and all that sort of brushed chrome door handles and and things like that it's all those those little little details but i mean obviously that's why ebay was invented and gumtree and all the rest of it um and charity shops are always good good places to start and you know i i find actually on the job i'm doing at the moment we've we've got really lucky with a couple of house clearance places for stuff and and newark itself is a sort of um Sadly, it's one of those, it's that classic thing of the high street. You know, every every third shop seems to be a charity shop. Um, so, you know, you, you just get lucky with, with certain things. The sofas for Tony's house in Afterlife, for example, I think they were from Facebook Marketplace and they were like, I think they were 100 quid for a pair of sofas. And when we found them, we just thought, well, these are absolutely perfect. We tried, we were thinking about hiring stuff because we can hire, you know, contemporary sofas, for example. Um, but we wanted to, with Tony's house, although what I mentioned earlier with the colours, I think we had an idea that the last time he had decorated was made, well, it would have been before Lisa had passed away. And we we thought the kitchen would have been done in the early 2000s. It was like the first bit they ever did. In fact, that was a kitchen from Howden's um, that we we managed to get some, they had some old doors. I, I did some research on kitchens. Who knew that 20 years ago, all the kitchens in Howden's and, and generally were very, a very light cream color with very long handles. That was the thing. And wood, dark wood seemed to play. We sort of got Howden's carcasses and we, we did some, we had some doors and then found some long handles. And then the worktop in Tony's is actually a, um, an oak worktop that we then stained a very dark wood because you couldn't we couldn't buy any dark wood that kind of rose with that slightly uh, redder wood that seemed to be very popular so we kind of went down that route for that and I know it's a very subtle thing but we were kind of proud quite proud of how that all turned out because it definitely had a sort of slightly dated feel to it you you just get lucky in prop houses or you just get lucky looking online and sometimes then that you can take your 
cue from that. I think Tony's got this lovely record player, this sort of 50s kind of 60s big record player that sits in the corner. You only see it in a couple of shots. But we found that and thought, well, that's a great unit. It's one of those sort of cabinet pieces. But then that gave me the idea, well, of course, then Tony is a collector and Ricky's scripts are peppered with um, musical references and the music you you hear in in Afterlife is, he writes those down in the scripts. He's got very clear ideas what music is playing and he's got those in the script. So that, of course, Tony's a record collector then. So that gave us the idea of giving the record collection. And if he's a record collector, then he's probably a book collector. And, and you know, and away it goes. And that all came, kind of came about from finding that record cabinet you know so yeah sometimes you you are climbing inside that that character's head aren't you yeah yeah and that's the fun bit I mean you know as I said for all the sort of planning and the logistics you know that's where the research is fun you know and that and trying to build up little backstories and Lisa's we the, the the reason why they live in such a big house but he um but he only works for a local newspaper is that you know Lisa's you know, parents left them some money, you know, that was the idea. And she had some money because she was very smart when he's not particularly smart. And she, we see her in the videos, uh, painting in the home videos, her doing painting. So Tony's house has got some of Lisa's paint paintings on the wall, you know, and that, you know, and so we then therefore, because Lisa paints, that gives Tony and Lisa a love of art and, you know, and they, and we've got quite a lot of art throughout, throughout the house. So his house in particular is kind of quite eclectic. It's very much a couple's house, that. And the idea, if you if you look at series one of Afterlife, all the plants are dead. And it's that idea. And the, but in the flashbacks, all the all the plants are alive. And it's the idea that he's kind of because he's given up. That's why the garden, well, you see the garden in some of the shots. It's that. He can't be asked to go out and deal with it, and it's and it, and it is literally the grass is always greener, and the, the the vertical blinds are kind of a metaphor for him being slightly trapped because it's inside a cage. He's sort of slightly trapped for where he is, and he just doesn't want to move on. So, yeah, all the plants inside the house are all dead because he's just given up looking after them. There's also a slight haze in some of the scenes. Am I imagining that? But I think it really adds to the atmosphere. Yeah, that's um come that that comes through Martin, our DOP's brilliant lighting, and he adds a sort of slight mist. A lot of the light is punching through those windows. Um, I mean, the garden's got some real depth to it. The front of the house, we've got net curtains and a and a an old fashioned painted backcloth. Little more than that, but you really notice it with the light streaming in through the um. The, the, the patio windows at the back um and martin's just got a little bit of haze in the air just to, and also it accentuates those kind of prison bar that prison bar idea billionaire boy very different kind of show but that must have been really fun oh wow um, there's one wow oh, yeah okay <laughs> that was uh with all the gold very grand yeah well that was a little bit more cli- i suppose in a sense that was a little bit more cliche written and we we shot that in um God, that's about five, six years ago now, five years ago. Um, we shot that up in um, a place called Wentworth Woodhouse, which is um, near Sheffield. I think it's owned or something to do with the Reese Mogg family, would you believe? It's it's used in Victoria, the uh, ITV drama series Victoria, and it crops up in uh, the Timothy Spall film about Turner. It appears it ends. That particular room is the Royal Academy in that story. Um, it's it was such a grand location, and and actually that those David Wall- I did three of the David Williams um, books, and you know they're big stories, but you don't get and without you know you don't get a massive amount of money to spend on them. So you have to be very um, you have to be very very clever how you do things. So when you get a location like that and that big room, that's just a dream because a lot of the work is kind of done for you you know you're making a huge statement and then the gold sofas that we have gold sofas they came from a higher company down in london and i think i made the coffee table um but yeah you just kind of went because it's kind i can't even remember the character's name now the dad but but um you just kind of wanted to it's slightly pantomime you just kind of want to overload on the cliche 
oh, of course he would have a helicopter. Of course everything will be made of gold. And he's got his motorbike in the living room for no reason other than the fact that he can. And we got a snooker, full-size snooker table, and there's a jacuzzi. And then he's, if you look in the back of shot, you only see on a couple of shots, there's actually a, an architect's model of the, the, the wood house. And they let us move it into this room. And we we fashioned in Perspex all these sort of add-ons that the dad character was going to do to this stately home. So there was a, a big helicopter landing pad that we placed on the model and a sat a big satellite dish and a, and a and a huge tube because that moment where he jumps out the bedroom and slides down the chute and into a swimming pool. The swimming pool was shot one place and the bedroom was shot in Wentworth with Woodhouse. Now the bedroom I'm really proud of the kids' bedroom. So I completely I'm I I love the film Big with Tom Hanks. Um, so what's that? 90, 80, 86, is that eighty seven? Big. I mean, it's one of my I just adore it. And that scene in Big where suddenly he's got the money, he's landed the job, and he's got the apartment, and he's got the trampoline, and he's got the pinball machine. I just love that as a design. I think that's a lovely design, and I completely stole every element of that for the boys' bedroom. To the point in big, there's a red tubular bunk bed. And I found a tubular bunk bed and I sprayed it red. So as a little proper homage to big uh, for, the, for the kids. Because, you know, it, that's I love about that. He's a child, you know, he's a grown up, but he's a child. And of course, all he wants is the top bunk. You know, so that that's the thing, what I did with Billionaire Boy. So I gave him, I gave, I think it's Charlie is the boy, the character's name. Um, I gave him the top bunk. There's inflatable dinosaurs because there's a scene in Big where Tom Hanks is punching a giant uh, pterodactyl or something. I haven't stolen Lucy. I, it's a homage. It's a it's an out and out homage to that. And there's a computer game and because <laughs> uh, they had a pinball machine. <laughs> a dun um, not Dunkin' Donuts. Uh, what was it? A Krispy Kreme. Very kindly gave us a donut uh, dispenser. The, you know, one of their ones that you find in. W. H. Smith, you know those ones those normally you get at service stations where all the donuts are in there. So they gave us one of those, um, and we had to cover the name up, but they were quite happy. So we had this donut donut dispenser in his bedroom, and um, and amazingly, we I think we shot over three days, two three days. They came back the next day and put fresh donuts in as well, which was which was such a bonus, such a bonus. That's service, isn't it? I bet I bet the crew tucked into those at the end of the day. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Why not? Why wouldn't you? Free donuts? Come on. Um, yeah, so that 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 was really fun. That in fact, all three of the Walliams, because I yeah, I did um, Boy in a Dress, Billionaire Boy, and Rat Burger. Rat Burger was more, there was definitely more design in that um, because I we with the warehouse and the Rat Burger machine, I had I had so much fun creating that um, kind of. I, I essentially I. Again, I stole, I borrowed um, the idea from the Mousetrap board game. So I kind of basically did a giant version of, you know, Mousetrap. In, um, but that, yeah, and then we built the house for that set. And I oddly, I used that same kind of peach. I, and, oh, there's a thing with colour. So on that, the house uh, in uh, Ratburger, which was the council flat that um, the, the main character lives in. I'm terrible with the names. I, they've completely gone from my head. Um, but the mother character played by Sheridan Smith, all she does is eat prawn cocktail crisps. That's kind of the character trait. So I, I made the entire house beige and peach because essentially the colours of prawn cocktail crisps. So the only room where there's colour is the is the, the the main girl in it. Her bedroom is the kind of oasis of colour. But everything else is a is a tone of beige or a tone of peach. And it's essentially the colour comes from a prawn cocktail crisp. I love that. I love that it's the whole thing's inspired <laughs> by Chris. Yeah, inspired by Chris. Who wouldn't be? I bet Jonathan Adler doesn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm I'm a big crisp fan, so I'll go with that. Yeah, at times you must be working on two different shows, or at least sort of starting the process for a new show. How does that balance itself out? Um, well, I, weirdly, you should say that because this. I mean, officially. You don't, but unofficially you are kind of, if you're lucky enough to sort of be asked to do something, then there is always a little bit of an overlap. Sometimes it's gargantuan and then you have to ask yourself, do I really want to do that? Because you are, you know, because you, your thoughts simply can't be in two places at once all the time. But I've had a little bit of that this year simply 
you know, a couple of weeks here and there crossover because I think what happened with lockdown and as I'm sure you know, that everything just ground to a complete halt for five months. And then I think consequently the world has gone bonkers in TV and film because I think everybody's playing catch up. So I've had a year this year like no other. I've never been busier than I have been this year. And I was doing, um, I was coming to the end of Afterlife and starting prep on a new series which is going out um, called Witchfinder. It'll be going out next year. I don't know when. Um, and it's a period thing and it's a comedy and it's uh, set in 16. Forty something, um, and it's uh, Daisy May Cooper plays a witch, and Tim Key plays a witch finder. So it's a kind of uh, a road movie, uh, a road story, road movie, road story about um, a journey between the two characters from A to B. Um, so interestingly, having just spent the last thirty minutes talking about color you're going into a period that's sort of slightly bereft of it because essentially if it's not made of wood or or not covered in hessian you're kind of you know you're going out on a limb apart from tapestries and all the rest of it but so that 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 was that was tricky because you're going full color and present day to 16 whatever's and hessian and wood and and trying to divide your thinking time it is your headspace ultimately what you what i think is would be almost impossible to do is to be in prep for two films and i don't think any production company would want that anyway because you can't be giving enough of your time thinking about two shows but i think with with afterlife i was coming to the the latter part of the shooting and let's be honest we're series three everything's established we've got a couple of weeks to go and um we were doing some of the house stuff. So I was able to go in and prepare the houses the morning of the day and then disappear and, and deal with, you know, um, the prep for the next thing, which is, uh, which is the reading of the scripts, the breaking things down, um, sketches coming up with, um, you know, going to see contractors and all the rest of it. It's, a, it's, it's, it's a hard question to answer because it's sort of, you, you just make time. I think what tends to happen, you end up doing quite a bit of weekends, actually. You, you know, if you're lucky enough to do a show that's only shooting five days a week, then your weekends end, end up becoming, you know, you know, thinking time. Um, and I, it's not something I like to do. I very occasionally, this year has been the one year where it's, I've, I've noticed I've done a bit more of it, but you, you try and try and avoid it. And I'm, the current job I'm doing and the last job I've not done it. And, um, the job I've got lined up, which I can't say too much about at the moment, but I'm, you know, I've got that lined up now. And, you know, I, that's, that starts middle of February for me. I'm not going to take anything more on up until that point. So um, just focus on one job, you know. And how do you switch off? Because being creative it is all encompassing, isn't it? What do you do to relax? Um, well, I've just spent the last five months um, having a massive extension on the house, so it, it's sort of life imitating art at the moment. But what do I do? In my so I haven't really done much this year. I had a very busy year, um, which I'm very, very lucky to have had a very busy year. But I guess I do galleries, um, and I live by the sea, which is always you know, which is lovely. And I'm a I'm a muse. Uh, my one of my passions is music. Um, I don't play a single note, but I've, I've been buying records since I can remember, and so I've got a you know four thousand plus record collection, and um, you know, so I, I kind of I'm never happier if I'm at a car boot or a charity shop or you know in a record shop, and I seem to spend equal amounts of time on Twitter and Instagram talking about music as I do about design. I, I I definitely think there's a for me there's a sort of correlation in terms of record sleeves. I growing up, you know, I was always fascinated. I, you know, much of the appeal of the music was sometimes to do with the what what it looked like and the artwork. And I've definitely that's influenced me over the years. I, you know, pop promos in particular have definitely gone in my head, and I've used ideas from pop promos on projects. I did um actually weirdly I did another show with Ricky. Uh, at the start of the noughties called Meet Ricky Gervais. It was a sort of chat show that he did on Channel 4. 
and the set is <clears throat> borrowed um, kind of almost wholesale from an REM video where I'd seen a particular, there was one particular moment in this REM video, I can't even remember which video it is now, this really interesting sort of panel using a very strong green and the way it was lit and I sort of replicated it and that formed the basis for the, the set for Ricky. So yeah, I mean, music is a huge part of my life. Um, and finally getting a record room, Lucy, which is, uh, I can't tell you as a, as a, as a middle-aged man, it's sort of, it, it's, it dreams do come true. Um, so our, um, the dining room of the house that we bought is now, and uh, now going to be my record room. Um, so when I finish next, I can't wait for this last week's to finish, just run up to Christmas. Not because the job's not been enjoyable, because of course it is, but um, just to finally put the last of the records away and start doing that bloke thing of, you know, putting them in some kind of order or, uh, and actually just playing them, the, the, the you know, the process of taking records out, looking at covers, records out of sleeves and pressing play. It, it, it's a, you know, not to not to romanticize it, but it's quite a religious experience, all that. And I love that whole thing. It's the thing that I don't think CDs ever did. And I think there's something about tangible and physical with the record. Um so yeah, that's kind of how I that's kind of how I switch off. And obviously I watch a bit of telly. Um, you know, a lot of I think a lot of us would say we don't watch that much telly, but I um yeah, what always a always a movie to find and you know, just everything really, but bit, a bit, bit of everything, Lucy. I guess. Um, I'm trying to imagine what your house is like in terms of having worked in TV. Have you got any memorabilia around, or have you got? Yeah, yeah. Kept some props. Of course, I have. I mean, official, official, yeah, officially or unofficially, Lucy. <laughs> unofficially. What can I say? And I don't know if I have a house style. It's quite an eclectic. I think it's eclectic, which is a bit of an obvious thing to say but I think it is and I my my girlfriend we bought a place together only a couple of years ago so you know it's that kind of combination of possessions but thankfully she has kind of quite similar taste to me but I've I I, I sort of find myself more and more because people the few people have been around now and seen the house how oh, lovely like, well, where'd you get that that's amazing and increasingly I keep saying oh I've acquired that I've acquired that and that seems to be definitely a buzzword for me in terms of how things end up in our house so I mean, I've got um, I've got one of the armchairs that was in Tony's house because the set's now, you know, it's all finished with, and it was all good. We we sent a lot of it. In fact, a lot of it got recycled and and used with a um a crowd a crowdfunding project up up in Newcastle, which I got involved with uh, for a documentary that's coming out next year. So I I sort of d donated some of the furniture to that um, and got heavily involved with that project. Um, but I kept one of the little armchairs that we bought in a charity shop of Tony's, which I'm going to re-upholster. Um, I've got, I won't say which film, but I've got a sofa from a very famous film um, in the house and, a, and, and some other bits and pieces. Yeah, so it's a kind of a mixture of charity shop finds and, um, and family heirlooms and, um, and stuff that I've sort of picked up along the way, really. I'm, I love I love a I love a kind of graphic poster um, and movie posters. Um, another thing that I've sort of got you know a couple of hundred movie posters you know buried away in various parts of the house, and um, so I've got a few of those up on the wall. Um, and I've actually weirdly the last year through Instagram I've sort of discovered a few artists, so I've bought a couple of little bits through their, you know, various LinkedIn, you know, when you, when you go on their websites through Instagram, I, I picked up some odds and sods there, which I really like. I really, um, um, I really like, there's a site called, um, L13 industrial workshop. I think it's called, and it's sort of, um, Jimmy Corti is one of the guys from the KLF is an artist and he's been producing some stuff, which I've bought, um Scott King Studio I really like the stuff coming out of there there's a guy in Brighton called John Jay who I bought a couple of bits so and a, a really lovely artist based up in Manchester called Jenny Orfin who paints motorway bridges um but they're just beautiful and very kind of evocative um 
images of sort of bridges and service stations and they just invoke you know really strong memories for me going to see my grandparents in in you know up and down the m4 sat in the back of the car and stopping at the services on the way up and they just have a very strong you know connection and she was selling a couple of her bits um this year so i bought a little print you know so yeah it's a it's a real it's a real hodgepodge of stuff and i collect badges so there's a you know, there's a little frame of badges and I've got scrapbooks, which I, you know, who, who'd have thought I'd have a scrapbook, but there you go. I've got scrapbooks and I keep all my ticket stubs from music, from gigs. And yeah, it's just a, it's an eclectic mix, mess, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> You're going to have even more room for it, aren't you? Oh God. Talk about, talk about um, filling the space. I, I kind of, we were clearing, we got a skip in the front garden. Look at me with the front garden, get me. Um, we, we got a skip in the front garden um, a couple of weeks ago, uh, actually just before I came up to do this job. And we filled it. And we and I said to my girlfriend, I said, we both, two years ago, we were living in one bedroom flat. And we're now filling skips with stuff. And we've had building work, so there's a bit of building stuff in there. But I don't know where all this stuff has come from. We were very fortunate, actually, yeah, when we moved into the house. So there was was, this lovely lady. I mean, she was clearly adored by everybody in this street. Sicily, her name was. To a point, we haven't told the locals, we're thinking of calling the house Sicily House. We think it's such a lovely name. That's lovely. So she, She only lived in the house for three months a year. She was German, so she spent a lot of time in Germany, and then she used to come over to England for the summer. Um, when we moved in, the, the the daughter was, you know, sadly she passed away and the daughter was doing the thing and there were some bits and pieces and we said, oh, we quite like some of those. So we said, oh, we need to, and, well, what do you think? And I, and I think she said, oh, 200 quid will be fine. You know, so we said, great. Um, so there was this beautiful G-plan sideboard that we sold, we did sell, but there's a lovely Victorian chest of drawers. There were three 1930s utilities chest of drawers that we kept. And this amazing rug in the in my record room and now uh, my record room, but huge, like a that's like a fourteen feet by nine, ten feet wide Persian y sort of rug. Um and that's now pride of place in our new extension under the dining room table, We've got it clean. You know, it, it was unbelievable. And we had this lovely Edwardian kind of padded little armchair, a nineteen art deco, nineteen thirties, low sort of little armchair. And she just said, oh, you might as well have it. Takes it off her hands. So we've done that classic thing, Lucy, where you say, oh, yeah, I'm going to get that holstered. So two years later, it's all in the garage. <laughs> but we will get round to doing some of it. But this um, carpet um, was was unbelievable. We found this guy in Worthing who came around and took it away, cleaned it for a weekend. I mean, it, I'm not trying to sound flippant about the money, but it was like £100 for this guy to go do it. But it, honestly, it was the best £100 you could ever spend. Because for me, I think that rug... The rug was pretty much free, you know. We we got left so many lovely bits of furniture. Um, yeah, so we've kept a bit of Sicily in the house. We definitely, and, you know, all the deeds. We're only like the fourth people to live in it since it was built in 1927. And um, I think two of those four people, the house was left. It was it was an inheritance thing. So it's a clearly well-loved house. You know, and there's that, you know, it's an obvious thing to say and everybody says it, but you you feel then you're custodians of it. And I want, we were really keen to keep, you know, we're really keen to keep a little bit of Sicily in it because she was clearly adored, you know, and they, we, we've inherited this massive back garden, which last year during lockdown was a godsend. This year is like bombs hit it again because, of course, I've been nowhere near it. But it kept me from going absolutely bonkers last year, certainly, because that's where my creativeness was allowed to sort of flourish because once you've tidied things up for the unthemed time and thrown things away, what did I do during lockdown? Well, I ended up being out in the garden sort of whittling and kind of creating things and trying to make a little bit of sense of it. I, you know, I, I became Tom Good, you know. Um, I own a lawnmower, Lucy. I've never owned a lawnmower in my life, you know. <laughs> No stopping you. But it's so lovely for Sicily that you appreciate those things that were left behind. I think that's really lovely. Yeah. No, well, she was, as I said, she was just, you know, and, and occasionally there's a lovely old lady who lives down the road. Who, 
I mean, I think she always, every time she comes down, she makes a point of saying, you know, I'm 93 and a half, you know, she, and this half is really important to her. Um, but she talks about the tea parties they used to have in the back garden. But I mean, she sounds like a right old hoot, um, to Sicily. And she left us this lovely um, little glass. Well, the daughter said, you can have this lovely little glass. I guess it's Victorian bookcase, which is now in our new kitchen with all our, you know, um, my girlfriend sort of turned over to all her ingredients are in there, you know, but it's a big glass kind of book, but also a, a whole stack of books. And then you, you then begin to find out a bit more because I, I love a book. I don't read as much as I should, but I love, I love a book. I just love books, what they look like. And, you know, the covers, I just love the tactileness of them. I suppose the same way that I love records, it's exactly the same thing and the way that they slot into a bookcase and the way they look. And there was a whole stack of books left. And then you get an idea of what she was about. There was a lot of language books. She studied at, at St. Andrew's University because there was loads of stuff. I think her, her, her husband was an airman because there was a load of stuff about the Air Force. Um, and she was really, and was clearly very well read. She was, and definitely history. She, she must have studied history because there's lots of stuff on British and European history in there. So we've got all these wonderful books we've got left as well. You clearly never really switch off from your work, do you? Because you're so interested in people, so it must be difficult to switch off. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, I, I, and I suppose the thing is, you're, you know, you can never switch off because you've got a little black box in the corner of the room reminding you every day of that's what you kind of do for a living, you know. And you know, I try, I try not to be, you know, I'm not critical of, you know, anybody else's work when I'm watching it on the telly, but. You do watch telly and you think, oh, I wonder how they've done that, or well, that's a nice prop, or I recognise that prop is more the thing because of the hire company. So you tend to spot things. Um, oh, I know where they've got that from. Oh, I know that location. Um, but um, yeah, it's a yeah, a little black box in the corner reminding, yeah, this is your this is your day job. So I've got one more thing I'd like to ask you before I'm going to let you enjoy your day off. <laughs> so is there any advice you can offer to anybody wanting to get into TV? Um, because well, your line of work is quite specific, isn't it? So what would be the best route at the moment? If it was specifically for my um, for what I do for a living, um, the best thing I think anybody starting out would be to go, go on um, a site like IMDb. If you're interested in the visual side of things, go go on a, go on to something like IMDb. Look up the designers or you know the the creative parts, people, the creative crew, I should say. Look up who designed it. Look at their other work, and you know, get hold. I think the world is so connected now; it's not difficult to get in contact with people or find people online. So, you know, do a bit of research if you're going to write a letter and you know, and introduce yourself and I want to get into TV, TV. A lot of designers get, we get letters. You get it at a certain time of year. Normally when the universities are clearing out, that's when you seem to notice a lot of emails appear or random text messages. It's always very good for, I, I feel it's always very good if somebody can personalize it because we, we all know that you can write a blanket email and just change the name at the top and you could send out 200 emails in a day easy if you wanted to um but if you can personalize that introduction email that makes a massive difference for me personally i just think it's i just think it's good look at what's going on in your area look at i mean down in brighton uh, for example near where i live there's um, a facebook group called brighton filmmakers and they're forever looking for people to get involved and I can't believe there are not other places in the country running similar schemes. I would, if uh, I would also look at the other roles within art department because, I mean, you could be very lucky and you know do a, you know, go on as a production designer. But chances are that would be a low budget project or whatever. And then you know if you, but if you want to, you know, a career in the in our in the creative part of uh, you know in the in the art department, then there is more to it than just production designer there are art directors standby art directors standby props dressing props um graphic props there are set decorators production buyers petty cash buyers there are scenic painters there are loads of different 
parts that make up the art department. And then I, I suppose in, to bring it hopefully rather neatly to what I was saying about watching TV and only really seeing the actors right at the very start of our chat, it's not just a production designer. There are I I am the kind of laughably the head of department, but you know I'm there are there is an army of people or a you know a team of people working with me who are for me personally just as important you know because they deal with when we're shooting with the action prop side or action vehicles or you know going out a petty cash buyer is such a sort of undervalued job and such an important job in terms of doing the dog work when you're you know you're putting a set together oh we need another three sets of door furniture that's a petty cash buyer's job you know if you're doing it you know oh i need a curtain rail and it's those little things like that that they're really vitally vitally important the other thing i would say as a life skill learn to drive if you don't drive you've got i think the art department is a job where you must be able to drive We'd all prefer to spend less time in our cars. We we all prefer to use public transport. I mean, I personally love traveling by train and would happily do that all day and every day if I could. But a petty cash buyer, a buyer, an art director when you're jumping between locations, supervising art director, and as a life skill, have a, you know, if you don't know how to drive, that's something that is critical, absolutely critical. You really need to do that. Um, there's a there's a thing called um there's a site called screen skills which is um for people who kind of uh want to get into art department and there's like they offer a kind of bursary scheme um where you can um if they if you get taken on by screen skills screen skills will try and find you um work placements so what the way it's funded is a lot of production companies pay put some money towards screen skills. I don't know the figures, but, you know, I guess the bigger companies put more, um, less companies. But, the, the, you know, the, it's, a, it's, a, it's basically a scheme funded by the industry. And then you might be on a job and you need a art department assistant or somebody and you contact screen skills and they can provide you with an art department assistant. And that assistant is being paid by the screen skills fund, not by production. So that's a look at looking to sort of screen skills. Um, and also anybody living outside the M25, there's a thing called Creative England. Um, and again, at all levels, you can apply to be on the Creative England database. And if you're just starting out and looking for just experience, that's a, that's a good thing. I think it's unique about outside the M25 because it feels like London and people within London are kind of plenty plenty catered for um but that's that's really good the creative england thing they're always looking for people um but as i said i'm sure like with the brighton filmmakers other big cities will have something similar any big creator i was in sheffield yesterday i can't believe there isn't something similar in sheffield it's such a kind of creative town um i would say that I don't know if that's advice. I'm I'm more about that's probably just telling people what to do. But um Well, it's very, very difficult to know where to start for somebody, you know, especially someone young starting out. So I think it's excellent advice. Thank you. Yeah, I just think, yeah, I mean, you the, the young people, quote unquote, are are um, you know, that they're, they're so much more connected than, you know, than I ever was. Um, so if you've got some kind of level of determination, you will definitely yeah you'll you'll find a way of reaching the person you want to reach to whether that's whether that's me as a designer or getting in touch with a production company or whatever i mean a lot of it's catching people at the right moment as well lucy is quite important as well i i'm i've got a couple of art directors that i use and one of those in particular joe who's just you know, I'm so glad I met her. She just happened to email me at the right time when I needed somebody. And it was, and I would say to anybody putting letters out, please don't take it personally if there's not an immediate reply because chances are the person you're messaging, if they're any good, is probably busy. Um, but it might be that day when that person needs somebody, your email fires up and lands on their inbox and it's just at the right moment. And as I said, this. Uh, Joe, we've worked together now 
on and off for 10 years and she just happened to message me when I was looking for something somebody for the comedy awards it was um the first ones I so exactly 10 years ago and I would say she's probably done two-thirds of the the shows I've done since well thank you so much I've I've really loved chatting with you today and um it's it's been really insightful and I've loved talking about Afterlife and all the other shows. So thank you very much. And I'm going to let you get on with your day and look forward to seeing more of your show soon. Lovely. Lucy, thank you so much. It's been an absolute delight. Richard's website can be found at www.richarddrew.tv and he's also on Instagram at our man in Cairo, that's C-A-I-R-O. And he can be found on Twitter at Dickie Drew. You can see what I'm up to over on my website, Lucy Gleason Interiors, www.lucylovesyou.com and find me on Instagram at Lucy Gleason Interiors. Have a good week and don't forget to subscribe to Live Your Own Way for the next episode. Until then, have a good one. Listener.